Imp Lemon video? Oh, it's about the cola wars. This is carbonated brown sugar water. And this is Coca-Cola. <laughs> These two products may seem identical, but in the world of business, this little red can makes all the difference. Yes, sir. It's the 1980s, and Coca-Cola is quickly approaching its 100th year as a business. The company brass aren't celebrating, however, as for the first time that nearly anyone can remember, Coke is in danger of losing its title as America's favorite soft drink. Oh. By 1985, Pepsi was on the verge of the unthinkable, overtaking Coke as the leading cola brand. However, as the old masters of the industry, Coke wasn't going down without a fight. That fight would come from their new chairman. Roberto Goizueta. The Cuban-born magnate was no stranger to trouble. In the 1950s, shortly after getting promoted to head of Coke's Havana bottling plant, Goizueta defected to the United States in the wake of oh, Fidel shit. Castro's communist revolution. <laughs> Damn, <laughs> escaping communist Cuba to become CEO of Coke? <laughs> you went for the most capitalist you, you know what I'm saying? That's <laughs> if you ever wanted to get back at Castro, becoming CEO of Coca-Cola is probably the best way to do it. That's crazy. For decades, Coca-Cola had marketed their product on tradition and permanence. The formula's lineage could be traced all the way back to its inventor, John Pemberton, becoming the eminent national beverage by the turn of the 20th century. Uh, you know, actually, I was alive at this time. It was nice. It was nice to be a marketer back then, because you could just say whatever the f you want. <laughs> If you look at old ads for anything, it'd be like a lump of sugar. All the old ads, like, oh, it's good for aches, pains, and cancer. <laughs> and it's like bubble gum. Yeah, I think oh. they had cigarette ads that were like four out of five doctors prefer X cigarette because it's, it's healthier. You know what I'm saying? It's ridiculous. Altering it would be like rewriting the Bible. And that's how the company thought until Roberto Goizueta became chairman. By 1984, the company's mighty 60% market share had shrunk to just over 20%. 20% of all beverages on earth. The fact that they ever had 60% is fucking crazy. They were selling more than half of all beverages on earth at one point. Decades of complacency had allowed Coke's competition to get back in the race. In a time of Cold War tensions, Roberto Guizueta had to resort to the nuclear option. A major factor behind Coke's declining market share was an yeah. ad campaign known as the Pepsi Challenge. Yeah. A blind taste test between the two colas that appeared to show an overall preference for the sweeter flavor of Pepsi. While not exactly scientific, the campaign was undoubtedly successful at persuading many consumers to switch to the blue brand. This led Coke to conclude that the only way to stop Pepsi was to beat them at their own game. So those 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 taste tests were generally real, and people also recreated them a bunch, and they were they were they held true. But the thing was, the Pepsi was just slightly sweeter. So if you have one sip of it, Pepsi tasted better in one sip. But like over the course of a whole bottle, people preferred Coke. Soon enough, they had synthesized the ultimate flavor, one that could consistently beat both Pepsi and the original Coke in a taste test. <laughs> with a potential new juggernaut on their hands. They just hand. dumped even more sugar in it. <laughs> they already have a lot of sugar. The company was now faced with a tough decision. They could release the new drink as a standalone product and risk further diluting the already crowded Coke lineup. Or they could do the unthinkable and replace the cornerstone of their entire brand. Ultimately, the choice was up to Roberto Goizueta. Years earlier, when he was in charge of Caribbean distribution, Goizueta had successfully boosted sales by slightly tweaking the Coke formula. He had already once committed the cardinal sin, but perhaps he saw it as a virtue. For Goizueta, the choice was clear. Coca-Cola, the product that he had sold for his entire <coughs> adult life, was on the way out. As the story goes, shortly before the launch, Roberto Goizueta sought out the blessing of his predecessor, Robert Woodruff, the man who had built Coke into the behemoth that it was. No one knows for sure what Woodruff really thought about the decision, because he wouldn't live to see it happen. In oh, March shit. 1985, Coca-Cola's most Goizueta killed him. <laughs> Oh my god, dude. He fucking scared him to death. No, he told him they were changing the formula and he died of a broken heart. <laughs> he said, over my dead body will you change the Coke formula. <laughs> and Goizueta said, that could be arranged. On April 23rd, 1985, 
new Coke was rolled out nationwide. The change was paired with an immediate new marketing Jesus campaign Christ. from company spokesman Bill Cosby. Roberto Goizueta confidently stood by his new product, already touting his decision as a success. The celebration was a- I didn't assume this is a success. This is a success. <laughs> Okay, Roberto, hold up your fucking horses for a second. Just because you got Cosby for the marketing campaign doesn't mean this is a fucking guaranteed success, bro. A tad premature, however, <laughs> as trouble was brewing beneath Coke's triumphant hubris, one that spawned right in their own backyard. Across its entire operational history, Coca-Cola has been headquartered in or near Atlanta, Georgia. For generations, many Southerners considered Coca-Cola as hallowed as barbecue and college football. It is their bona fide beverage of choice. I mean, it might be. I think I think that part of the South calls all sodas Coke. The Midwest really says pop. I think the coast say soda. The South just calls every soda Coke. It's like they're Google. The fierce <laughs> brand loyalty of the region may have led to complacency among Coke leadership, who developed an expectation that Southern customers would welcome any change with open arms. Shortly after the switch, the prevailing sentiment in the South was one of abject betrayal. <laughs> For many, it represented yet another pillar of Southern tradition that had been surrendered to the Yankees. Announcing the product smack <laughs> I'm not sure that that seems like a stretch right because the Civil War was like a hundred years more than that this was in the 1980s this is like a <laughs> more than 40,000 letters of protest quickly piled up in coca-cola's office mailbox a company hired psychiatrists who listened in to some of the messages observed some customers acting as if they had lost a family member <laughs> Your fucking carbonated sugar water flavored got slightly sweeter and it's like you fucking lost your brother. In a controlled survey, people can't influence each other's opinions, but in the real world, it's not that simple. While most people were ambivalent about new coke, those who disliked it really disliked it. <laughs> this vocal minority would end up tarnishing the new formula in the eyes of the entire general public. <laughs> This common circumstance led to frequent cases where drinking new Coke could potentially place someone in an awkward social situation. <laughs> For many, it was simply easier to avoid judgment and order something else. The inf this is like blue bubbles, dude. That's so funny. You're getting canceled for drinking new Coke. The media kept reporting on eccentric stories about just how far certain people had gone to express their displeasure towards the switch. There was the story of Dan Locke. From now on, my life will be divided into BC and AC. Before the change in Coke and after the change. I honestly don't know what I'm going to do. Dude, what the fuck? <laughs> that cannot be so pivotal to your life. Stockpiled 110 cases of the original formula. Speaking of stock... <laughs> That'll show them. I'll show these fuckheads at Coke what they get for messing with their formula. I'll buy hundreds of their product. <laughs> I'll buy... I'll clean up the entire empty stock. When America's domestic supply was completely exhausted, a few loyalists resorted to smuggling in the old formula from foreign countries who had not yet made the switch. But by far the king of new coke hostility was a Seattle man by the name of Gay Mullins, who would use $100,000 of his own money to found a new organization for enemies of the new formula. He spent a hundred grand in 1985 dollars to create a no new court organization? His battle tactics included selling anti-new coke merchandise, spamming the hotline with complaints, and organizing mass protests which dumped gallons of new coke into the local sewer. At one point, Mullen- <laughs> Every one of these protests involves buying coke. Does anyone notice that? The constant hijinks would attract a ton of media attention to the movement, helping to grow Mullen's army to as much as 100,000 strong. That's crazy. Together, these minor demonstrations effectively counteracted millions of dollars of Coca-Cola marketing. For as much <laughs> as Coke tried to salvage the image of their new product, the American public was sticking to their own narrative. It was only a matter of time before everyone saw New Coke as the most despised beverage in the nation. <laughs> to make matters even worse, New Coke had crossed the threshold where it was simply fun to hate. During a baseball game yeah. at Houston's Astrodome, the crowd in attendance would infamously erupt in booze any time a New Coke ad flashed on the jumbo <laughs> train, with one Alabama reporter even insinuating that the whole idea was a communist plot to destroy a champion of American ingenuity. <laughs> 
Dude, always count on the South. Always count on the South to find a way to bring it back. <laughs> Roberto Gazueta, if memory serves me, is from Havana, Cuba. Imagine that. <laughs> This theory wouldn't quite hold up after Fidel Castro, a longtime Coke drinker, published his own comments bashing the new formula. <laughs> Ironically, Fidel Castro made a statement about new Coke as a sign of capitalist decadence, as opposed to the old Coke, which had 60% of the global drink market. <laughs> Shortly after new Coke hit store shelves, Pepsi saw a 14% sales increase, oh, the shit. biggest in their entire history. Internally, Coca-Cola's officials were starting to panic. With no other options, the company swallowed their pride and submitted to the will of the people. In the latest battle of the Cola Wars, Coke says it's bringing back its old formula. Within the next several weeks, the original taste, which many people in the country apparently missed, will be available again. On July 11, 1985, Coca-Cola announced we did the return it. of the original formula. Ending the new Coke experiment after just 79 days. The people finally win, dude. If we complain loud and long enough, we can get a corporation to sell us <laughs> the same thing they already sold us before. <laughs> Following the controversy, longtime spokesman Bill Cosby would part ways with the company, claiming that promoting new Coke had hurt his credibility. <laughs> this left Coke. Yeah, Cosby. Yeah, I think you're going to look back on your life at the end of it and think that was what really hurt my credibility. Roberto Goizueta, the mastermind behind it all, continued to swear by his creation. He personally drank the product until his death in 1997. <laughs> That's so petty, dude. They don't even sell it in stores and you're fucking bringing a bottle of new Coke to meetings. Love the taste. Lo oh, I can't get enough of this. Why do we ever get rid of this thing? The return of Coke Classic led to nationwide euphoria. Sales figures not only rebounded, but went on to surpass what the brand had been doing prior to the switch. Somehow, the biggest failure in industry history had directly contributed to its biggest success. Strangely enough, Coke Classic wasn't exactly the same as Classic Coke. The returning <laughs> formula had entirely switched to using corn syrup as a sweetener. Gay Mullins, who received the very first can of Coke Classic, reported feeling sick after drinking it. But for the vast majority, it simply didn't matter. I was born far too late to experience the summer of new Coke. The stories I heard felt like something of an urban legend. For as much research I've done, the literature, the footage, and the data don't tell the full story. Mm. After dedicating so much effort trying to understand new Coke, the only thing left to do oh, he got was one? taste it. How do you even drink that? Because it's delicious. What? In 2019, new Coke experienced a brief revival after being featured on the hit Netflix series Stranger Things. As part of a promotional stunt, Coca-Cola would release a limited run of the 1985 formula. So I picked up a case and for the first time in my life, tried the flavor that whipped an entire nation into a frenzy. And to be perfectly honest, it was kind of hard to taste the difference. <laughs> it's probably because I don't- Dude, they probably didn't even remake it. They probably just fucking rebottled. <laughs> but I could barely tell the two drinks apart. <laughs> Funnily enough, even a guy like Gay Mullins, New Coke's most ardent critic, couldn't tell either. After finally experiencing the world's most in- Wait! Gay Mullins couldn't pick out the old Coke from six other brands in a taste test. And he spent $100,000 fighting the fucking change. Coca-Cola, 26 grams of sugar. New Coke, 42. They just, they just, that's like I said at the beginning. They just made it crazy sweeter. Unlike what the marketing may tell you, independent taste tests have consistently shown that the average person <laughs> can't tell the difference between Coke and Pepsi. <laughs> this is especially interesting, since many people today believe that new Coke failed because it was a bad product. But in my personal assessment, that's simply not <clears throat> the case. The product itself was fine, and had it been executed a little differently, it could have been just as successful as any other Coke flavor. In consumer society, people don't have much. Take away those products, and you erase the soul of modern man. That's when it was sad. all said and done, Coca-Cola and the it's entire sad that the soul of modern man is dependent on <laughs> mass available cheap products. If you have a formula that's worked for almost a century, it's probably best to stick with it.
That was a good video. That's sad, my brother, my streamer in Christ who work as a marketer. It doesn't mean I believe that modern people's soul needs to be dependent on products. That's not what the job means.